about this stuff. Um, so the whole thing was actually announced in English, and just to make sure that you know uh, nobody gets disappointed, I thought about doing this in English actually. Um, I hope that's fine. You can ask questions in German later if you want to, but I'll just go through the slides in English. Uh, we have about 45 minutes, which should be enough to cover what I have to say about seven updates and leave us some room for questions. And I'll be around for uh, discussions later if you want to at the Oracle booth in the exhibition area. So my name is Dalibor Topic. Um, I work for Oracle as a, a principal product manager these days on OpenJDK. Uh, and one of the other things I do is uh, I'm the project lead for JDK 7 Updates project in OpenJDK. And this is what I'll be talking about here. And if you've seen a presentation from one of my colleagues from Oracle, you may have seen this slide. If you haven't, take a minute to read it. There will be a test at the end. And I'm sure you're all fast readers, so let's do a bit of a survey. Um, this is talk about JDK 7 updates. So how many of you have downloaded JDK 7 or an update? Okay, that, that's good. I should take pictures, actually. Um, how many of you actually um, know that we have for JDK 7 preview builds on JDK 7.java.net? I've tried one of these out. Okay, thank you very much for trying these things out. And please provide us with feedback on upcoming you know, features and things that don't work. And the same for JDK 8. We're working on JDK 8 right now, summer 2013. Anybody? OK, I'll, I'll speak about it next year, maybe a little bit. And finally, we're all on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, OpenJDK is on Twitter, and so on. You can follow us there if you want to know the patch by patch play. With seven updates, um, well, I'll give you a bit of a background here. In June 2011, Henrik Stoll, who is a senior director of product management um, at the Java Platform Group at Oracle, uh, and he's responsible for Java strategy for Java SD and Java ME, wrote a blog post saying that we are moving to OpenJDK as the reference implementation. Um, and specifically, uh, in its role as a specification lead, Oracle is responsible for delivering the Java SC 7 reference implementation in line with our strategy towards a more open Java ecosystem. We're going to provide a reference implementation that is based entirely on the OpenJDK open source code and make it available under the GPL open source license. And for those of you who don't know, the way um, Java platforms work is that there is always a corresponding JSR, Java Specification Request, which uh, happens in the Java Community Process, JCP. And each JSR has three components. One of them is the specification, so a written document saying what the platform does, what the APIs are, for example, what language features are, what the VM features are, and so on and so on. There is a corresponding test suite, the TCK, which lets us validate that implementation actually meets the requirements of the specification. And then there is the reference implementation. And the purpose of the reference implementation is to serve as a reference. Kind of like the kilogram in Paris serves as the reference for all the other kilograms out there. Right? So um, this was a pretty big deal. Um, prior to that, at Sun Glassfish became the open source reference implementation for Java EE. And now at Oracle, with Java 7, OpenJDK became the RI for Java SE 7. And this reference implementation was available for download, is now, the, is of course, available for download on the JDK 7.java.net website. This is the actual URL. It's based only on the open source code from the JDK 7 project. So there was a project to create JDK 7, which took four and a half years, or less than a year, year and a half after Oracle acquired Sun, let's put it this way. Um, and that project produced the source code for the reference implementation and corresponding binaries. The binaries um, on that side are for Linux uh, in 64 bits and Windows in 32 bits, but they're primarily provided for use by implementers of Java SE 7. So they're not for end users. Of course, you can use them if you really want to, but you really shouldn't because they haven't been updated. It's a, like I said, reference implementation. You don't go to Paris and paint the Ur kilogram new in blue because it's the reference. You don't touch it once it's done. So nevertheless, now that we had um, this wonderful Java SE 7 GA release in July, um, when we announced that this is the first Oracle of the Java platform in Oracle Stewardship, um, and it was developed in the open, in OpenJDK, following an open process, and so on and so on, um, OpenJDK basically served as the basis for the Oracle JDK 7 release in July. And we figured 
it will make sense to continue to do that with update releases as well. So for those of you who are not familiar with Java SE 7, um, it's not a big revolutionary release, but it contains many, many small enhancements and very useful features um, covering all aspects of the platform, um, from language features uh, in Project Coin, where we added six small improvements to the Java programming language to make it easier for you to write more reliable um, programs, by, for example, using you know diamond operator to save typing or tribal resources to deal with resources in a more effective manner, to class library changes. Um, there are two major JSRs are JSR 166Y with the new framework for concurrency, um, um, divide by conquer style pro uh, problem solving called fork join, as well as uh, an uh, IO API update called NIO.2, which brings um, well, long overdue improvements to the Java file implementations, for example, um, as well as support for um, iterators over iteration of directories, um, virtual file systems, all the good stuff you would expect from a modern platform in its core. And finally, last but not least, we also had one big change for the first time in 15 years uh, in, the, uh, in the virtual machines. We had, we had a new bytecode called Invoke Dynamic, which per se in 7 isn't really useful for Java itself, but it's actually there to make it easier to implement new dynamic languages on top of the JVM. And implementations like JRuby are actually making successful use of it, um, both performance-wise as well as code-wise, because it lets them you know, get um, right, more compact implementations without having to rely on reflections or bytecode generation to get what they need to do to invoke code the Ruby way or the Python way or what you have. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other things in 7. There is a nice presentation, if you can catch it at a jug nearby, um, called 55 New Things in Java SE 7 that covers everything from Unicode 6 updates to what have you, security changes and all that. And of course, all that is listed in the Java SE 7 release contents, the JSR 336, as well as the corresponding specifications referenced from that. So, like I said, we released Java SE 7 in July. We're done. We're moving on to 8. Well, not quite, right? Um, not a release 7. We started to think about, to, to basically plan ahead for the updates and started to think about how we do the updates in the open. So we created a new JDK 7 updates project rather than continuing to use the old JDK 7 project because um, the JDK 7 project, like I said, was effectively done by providing the reference implementation. 7 updates are a different kind of project. Um, it's, it's not a platform release that takes multiple years. It's something that releases, you know, update releases every couple of months and thereby needs to be run in a slightly different fashion. So the JDK 7 updates project in OpenJDK, um, like all the other OpenJDK projects, is a website, openjdkjava.net, project slash JDK 7U, and the 7U is the kind of abbreviation we use everywhere. The same for the Mercurial repositories, so we use Mercurial in OpenJDK, so it's ag.openjdkjava.net slash JDK 7U, JDK 7U for our master repository for the source code. And like I said, the, the big deal about this is that Oracle JDK 7 update releases are based off the source code base. And this, is, this was a bit of a challenge for us because um, this hasn't been done before, right? If you look at Oracle JDK 6, it really has nothing to do with Open JDK 6. Open JDK 6 was created about a year and a half after, or of, after Sun at the time released Java SE 6 in 2006 and Open JDK 6 came in 2008. Um, thereby, Open JDK 6 was basically a version of Open JDK 7 at the time, cut down to match the APIs from Java SE 6. Not the same source code and therefore not really maintainable in parallel. So with 7, we're kind of starting, we started from the same thing and we're doing the maintenance work we do in the open in Open JDK. And then of course, Oracle JDK has components that are not in Open JDK. There are some things in Open JDK we don't use, yada, 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 but it's basically based on what we uh, do in Open JDK. And since it's an open source project in the open source community, um, we need to have a transparent development process. So we can't just have random commits happening. And that's why we spent some time um, trying to figure out, firstly, um, how Sun and then Oracle managed the, the regular updates, because whatever we had had to fit into that. And of course, spent some time discussing with um, uh, downstream users of, of the JDK and Open JDK uh, how this should work on the, on the um, project's mailing list. So what we do is we have public uh, approvals for commits, 
That means nothing goes into repositories uh, for JDK 7 updates without um, somebody posting you know, what the patch is about, a link to the corresponding bug report, a link to the review thread, and getting your approval from one of the four S maintainers from the, for that release. Um, the reviews are done in public. Um, we have bulk integrations for uh, things like Hotspot or JXP or JXWS, which come from basically other projects in OpenJDK or in Glassfish. And most importantly, we've tilted the process a bit to encourage developers to go and submit bug fixes into JDK 8 first and then backport them to JDK 7 updates. And the reason for that is, is really quite simple. Um, what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to get stuck with a situation where um, next summer we would be close to releasing JDK 8 and all of a sudden we have to, to forward port all these, you know, bug fixes from 7 updates into 8. So that's why we have a process which effectively makes it easier for you as a developer uh, to get fixes into 7 updates if you go the route of JDK 8 first. Um, and to make this even easier for our developers, we use the opportunity to simplify some of the processes and take inspiration from uh, the way OpenJDK 6 was run by Joe Darcy and uh, Kelly O'Hare. So we have an always open mainline forest, that's the one up there, um, where fixes can go in at any time. It's just the release that they come into depends on where we are in the, in the corresponding time frame. And we use Mercurial as a tool, so we add additional forests as needed. So for example, we add forests for new releases when we go into a ramp down phase. We've done this for 7 update 2. This was the forest for 7 update 4, which was released um, in late April. And of course, we had an integration forest for the Mac West import. And it was a really busy year for the project. So um, like I said, we started in, in June 2011 with a project being proposed on the OpenJDK list to so the OpenJDK community. It was approved by the build group at the time. In July, we uh, got our own Mercurial Forest based on the then JDK 7 built 147 code. And then we started to discuss development processes in the community. By August, we had, we had the development processes pinned down. They're all on the JDK 7 update website if you want to read them. Um, and in September, we created our first release forest for the 72 release. And we started to ramp down towards that release. Then in October, uh, 71 was released. That was a critical patch update. And you, you probably know this one thing here that um, I spoke about 72 and all of a sudden 71 comes up. Um, the reason for that is that it's a critical patch update and that means it may contain security fixes so these kind of releases are not developed in the open. They can't be. Um, instead, when it's released, the corresponding applicable fixes get applied to the OpenJDK 4S7 updates. That's how this code comes in. Um, and 71 in particular had some fixes for issues reported by Apache Lucene developers when JDK 7 was released. Then um, that was uh, October. In October, Java 1 last year, we announced a roadmap for JDK 7 updates from JDK 8, uh, including the announcement that we uh, plan to release um, a Mac OS 10 port in 7 update 4 for developers and uh, for consumers in 7 update 6. So it was quite clear that we had to uh, begin working on integration of the Mac OS X project from OpenJDK into the seven updates. Um, this started in November with a new forest for that merge. And this project, and, and this port basically made its way from the BSD port. Then in 2010, Oracle and Apple announced they're going to work together um, to bring the Apple implementation into the, open, the OpenJDK, created a separate project for that in 2011. And then by the end of 2000, 11, it was integrated in 7U. We released 7 Update 2 in December, and then 7 Update 3 last February. Uh, by then, the Mac port was integrated, and we had split off the 4S for 7 Update 4. And then, of course, 7 Update 4 last, well, last couple of weeks in April. And since early of this month, since early May, uh, the Oracle JDK 7 Update 4 is actually the default that you get on java.com. So basically, we've gone in a year from being a new project to actually being the default implementation, the basis for the default implementation people get when they go to java.com, which is huge for something that's being done for the first time in the open. Because like I said, this is a very different project from, the, from a typical open JDK project that's more experimental. It could take a couple of years to get done. This is a meat grinder, so to say, for patches. Um, I mentioned compatibility in the beginning. 
um, and the test suite. So uh, there was such a thing for six, and of course we also worked to enable the community to do completely testing for seven. Uh, Donald Smith, uh, who is a director of product management in the Java Platform Group at Oracle, on his blog announced in January this year that the Open JDK Community TCK License Agreement, that's very mouthful, short abbreviation is OCLA, for Java SE 7 is available. You can download that license on the Open JDK legal page. It's fundamentally the same as it was for Java SE 6 with a few small changes for clarification purposes. In particular, as Donald says, there are some details clarifying um, um, some common use cases for respect to confidentiality. Uh, so this was a pretty big deal for everybody who wanted to ship their own compatible binaries, like new distributions. That means they could sign up and actually start doing the work and compatibility. Um, then, of course, uh, there were some nice set opportunities. Now that we had this project up and running, and we were working on seven updates in the open with the community, we could look at things we didn't have to do anymore. And one of those things we didn't have to do anymore was to continue to publish um, or to start publishing Oracle JDK 7 under the DLJ license, which is an old license Sun used from 2006 on for its own binaries to get into distributions. And that kind of got sidetracked or irrelevant over time as most distributions started to adopt OpenJDK 6 starting in 2008. And then it became pretty much a foundation for the work done in Ubuntu and, and Fedora and, and Debian and so on to package everything on top of that. So in August last year, I blogged as the, the lead project for that JDK Deezer project that we are retiring that license with the Open JDK 7 as the basis for the Oracle JDK and being much closer in sync um, with Oracle JDK than Open 6 was. Uh, the license was no longer necessary. Um, and that allowed us to basically eliminate an old license and continue to provide everybody with the same single license agreement, the BCL. Um, this, the timing of this was um, deliberate. Uh, we announced this in August. The next critical patch update was in October that left everybody with a couple of months, about three months, uh, which is like half a uh, distribution development cycle for most distributions to figure out how, um, um, how to start packaging uh, OpenJDK 7 updates. And most of them did by October. Uh, so the feedback we received, um, in particular from people who were familiar with the DLJ, like David Heron, who was the previous JDK District Project Maintainer, or Simon Phipps, or Tom Marble, who was the first guy who did this at Sun in 2006, was positive on this move. Um, David's blog, for example, from uh, last December says that over the course of a time, the OpenJDK project became really good. It was no longer necessary to maintain the DLJ project, and there's nothing evil in all that. It's simply that the project became irrelevant. And that's spot on. So that's what we did there. Um, and that's why I think you're seeing so many distributions now um, work so hard to make sure that they actually uh, work well on top of OpenJDK 7. With Fedora 17, I think, uh, making it the default runtime in, in the upcoming release. And Ubuntu doing the same, as far as I know, for their upcoming autumn release. And as long as I'm talking about switching to uh, OpenJDK 7, I should also mention briefly um, Java SE 6. So um, back in February, Hendrix um, posted a blog post uh, saying that um, we've updated the Java SE 6 uh, timeline for uh, end of life of public support and public releases. And that means that at some point in time, Oracle stops putting, you know, um, JDK 6 available for public downloads on its website. It becomes a, it becomes a support product that customers can, can buy who still need it, and everybody else basically moves on to 7. Um, and that EOL date before February used to be July 2012. And you know people are concerned it was too soon, so we extended this um, to, to November 2012 to allow some more time uh, for the transition to JDK 7. And we updated the URL policy, which you can find on the Oracle website to reflect that um, and to reflect our intent for this and future major releases. And as we did that in February, the next question I got at FOSTEM conference from the Linux developer was, OK, that's great for Oracle JDK, but what about OpenJDK 6? I mean, they're the same thing. What's going to happen there? Um, and as we announced that we're moving to Java 7 as a default on, on Java.com, 
Uh, Henrik also had in this blog post from, um, I think, late April, a section on, on Oracle's contribution to OpenJDK 6. And he says that as the vast majority of Oracle's maintenance effort in the OpenJDK community is for Java SE 7, so it's focused on seven updates, um, users of a previous release of OpenJDK 6 should consider upgrading to OpenJDK 7, of course, or uh, to Oracle JDK 7, depending on their requirements. And in line with the longer posting updates of Java SE 6 after November 2012 to Oracle's public download sites, we don't have plans to contribute further changes to OpenJDK 6 project after November. So it will get the security applicable fixes uh, until then, but that's basically going to be it. And that's, I think, part of the motivation where you're seeing distributions now adopting seven updates. And like I said, we've been really busy with seven updates over the past year. We had two major releases now. Uh, the first one from last December was the seven update two release, which basically took from July till December. It was the first ever JDK update release done in the open, um, and it you know it, it shipped in in the same year it was supposed to ship, which is great. Um, it included a new hotspot version. Hotspot is the the JVM um, version 22, and uh, the the big deal here is that we're not updating the hotspot in Open JDK 6, right? So if you want a new performance improvements, if you want a new performance fixes you need to go to OpenJDK or to work with JDK 7. Um, then, of course, 7 u 2 included support for Oracle Solaris 11, which we released also last autumn. Um, and then the usual things. So, for example, one of the usual things you have in pretty much every JDK update release is you have a time zone database update. Because somewhere somebody thinks that the daylight saving time, you know, should start a day earlier or a week later or there's a new government that says, we're going to liberate you for daylight saving time. So basically, every couple of months, there's about 200 countries in the world, somebody changes something about time zones. So, you know, so pretty much every release, you have one of these things. Um, the next item is, is a more interesting one. So like I said, in Project Coin in 7, we had this project to have small language changes, like tiny, things like being able to switch over strings, the long overdue feature, right? Um, obvious to most people. It is. We tested it. It worked well for us. But then when we released 7, somebody actually found a bug in that feature. And it turned out that if you were, were, had you know, case statements with uh, string constants, and the string constants were in, in braces, the Java C compiler would crash. So we fixed that <laughs> in 7 update 2. Right? So, so got those bugs out there. And of course, all the fixes from 7 update 1 um, were in 7 update 2 as well. Uh, in total, we had 308, 318 issues fixed across 13 builds. To give you a perspective on that, um, JDK 7 over four and a half years was about 9,000 issues, right? So different, you know, different projects, different scopes, thereby different release models and then different processes. Uh, the 7 update 4 release um, it was the one we now shipped a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you can get, if you're not a Mercurio fan, uh, or if you don't want to mess around with Mercurio Forest, you can go and just grab the source code as a zip file at this convenient download location, which is also you know, linked off the OpenJDK project's webpage. And the big deal in this one was this macOS 10 port. So I think this is the, uh, probably the first time that a lot of people using Java kind of noticed that this is actually happening in the, happening in the open, in the OpenJDK. Um, because this was the first time that Oracle actually uh, used OpenJDK 7 updates project to ship an Oracle JDK on the Mac. At the same time, they ship everything else, right? And for, Mac, for, for Apple users, that's a really big deal because they used to get their updates later. Let's put it this way. Um, so being able to do this in OpenJDK was, was quite a benefit because we were able to actually engage community from early on and you know, get their feedback on how we integrate uh, the macOS 10 port into 7 updates and then into 8 uh, to get their feedback on bugs they found, to get their feedback on patches we proposed. And of course, uh, in the course of that, um, we had a lot of really great conversations and, and great input and some nice patches from, from Apple team and so on. So this is the JDK that we brought into 7 update 4. I'll tell you a bit more about 7 update 6 in the next slides. Then of course, new release, we had a new hotspot version. Uh, 23, 
This one brought in some uh, low-level tools like the JCMD tool for serviceability. There are some nice you know, posts about that by Marcus Hurt from, uh, from the Oracle JVM team. Um, and of course, it's all, in, uh, it's all in our release notes. But the big deal for many people who are not on the Mac is that the new garbage collector, G1, is now officially supported uh, with 7 Update 4. So um, I think this is something that a lot of people have kind of looked forward to. Uh, and at uh, the Oracle JDK release has been ran through the you know various test suites. We Oracle makes a lot of Java code, so something called Future Builderware and all that. So it's it's turned out to be a really solid release. We've updated JXP uh, to version 1.4.6, and then of course the usual thing, we have the CPU fixes from 7.53 that made their way into 7.4 as well, and then the rest of it. So. I didn't uh, have time this morning to run statistics to give you an exact count of how many patches there were, but I think it was probably in the same ballpark as 7 Update 2. At least time-wise, it was from, if we go back to the timeline slide, there we go. You can see how um, we created the ramp down forest in September for 7 Update 2, released in December, and then in a similar fashion, created the forest in February for 7 Update 4, released in April. All right, 7 Update 6, that's the one we're working right now. Um, this one, of course, has a hotspot upgrade. Uh, it's not a major one, so it's 23.2. There is some fixes in there, some bug fixes in particular. Uh, more importantly, for the enterprise users, there are XML component upgrades. Uh, just this weekend, Kelly O'Hare pushed um, uh, the update to JXP 2.2.4, JXWS 224, and so on. Then um, uh, Daniel Doherty from Oracle has added uh, support for full debug samples as a build option, so that you can get debug info files to make it easier to debug the OpenJDK uh, when you know as a, as a build option, which I think is useful for people who are uh, looking at hacking hotspot and hacking the OpenJDK. And of course, if you look at the commit logs, and you can see this being developed in the open patch by patch, right? This is all happening in the open repositories on the open list. Uh, you'll see that many of the bug fixes really have a macOS 10 prefix. So we're continuing to work with the macOS 10 support um, and to make other improvements. Edward Wendelin, so, well, I'm the, the project lead, and these dates, I wear this hat, this hat more ceremonially, and the real work is done by Edward Wendelin, who's technical lead. Um, he posted to the uh, to open mailing list um, with uh, our release timeline for the, for 7U6. Uh, currently, we're focused on stabilizing this release. Uh, we're open for general bug fixes up until mid June, and then that's going to be followed by a period where we only fix P1 to P3 bugs until early July, and then critical fixes only. So we gradually ramp down towards the release and and kind of uh, keep pushing the bar higher on what kind of fixes can make its way into that release for us, right? For the main line, the, the bar remains considerably lower because if somebody has, say, you know, compiler warning fixes, that's okay too, right? Just not very critical to get into 7 update 6. Um, and then corresponding on, on, on the other side of the Oracle JDK, um, we're working on 7 update 6 there as well. You can get, like I mentioned in the beginning, the early access developer preview builds on JDK7Java.net. And the big focus on that one is, um, as we said at the, um, uh, the Java one uh, last year, uh, is uh, the macOS 10 port for end users, which means a JRE, Java Runtime Environment, which means plugin implementation for the Mac, which means Java Web Store for the Mac, uh, improved integration with the operating system, and some auto update functionality. So that's the stuff that's not in OpenJDK. That's the stuff that's in Oracle JDK, which you can test on that side. And of course, you can, you know, if, if you want to give us feedback, you can run these builds, or you can just grab the source code for OpenJDK 7 updates uh, from the repositories I showed in the beginning, build it yourself. It's become much, much simpler over the last year. And let us know what you find. And let us know if you're happy with the performance, if you find issues, you know, if you find problems. We like to hear about these things, because doing these things in the open is a massive opportunity for us to actually, you know, engage various people who just we wouldn't be able to engage otherwise. And 
finally, let me close with the, the riddle I had for you in the beginning. One word is different. Okay. Now we can do some Q&A if you want to. I want to keep this kind of short and quick so we can get over to the fun part for me, which is, you know, asking you questions, no, answering your questions. And of course, I'll be around at the, um, at the Oracle booth today and tomorrow. So does anybody have any questions? It really depends on your requirements. So in terms of how uh, Oracle JDK is based on OpenJDK, there are basically bits and pieces that are only in Oracle JDK, like the plugin and web start from Oracle. Um, there, the IST community has developed its own independent open source implementations, but not the same. Um, but there are also bits in OpenJDK that we don't use in Oracle JDK, like the zero backend, for example, for Hotspot which is something people use to make OpenJDK run on, on various, say, Debian machines, you know, Z-series and what have you, um, which we don't, right? So I think that the major difference here really is that um, it, it really depends on what your goal is. So if you're, you know, if you're an institution that wants to ship open source software, then obviously you're going with OpenJDK. If you're an ISV that wants to ship something along with their software and it's proprietary software, then probably going with, with Oracle JDK. It really depends on what scenario you have. Um, but the nice thing about doing, you know, being a, a in sync between open and close, uh, and doing this in the open is that we can get um, useful feedback on on features as they make their way into updates, on bugs as they make their way out of updates. I hope um, as early as possible in this in this cycle, right? Um, as as the code comes in, rather than maybe weeks or days later um, in in the in the rundown to seven, um, I mentioned this Lucene, Apache Lucene bug. Um, I think that one was filed basically a couple of days before actual, you know, seven release. And by doing things differently now with seven updates, you know, being more open about what we do, being more transparent about the process we use to develop these things, I think we can engage um, distributions and, and open source users more directly, more earlier in the process than before. And that's a benefit both for OpenJDK as well as for WorkJDK because it's based on it. Which doesn't answer a question, but like I said, it depends. Um, the hotspot is the same on OpenJDK and Oracle JDK. Almost. Um, there are bits and pieces, um, basically. In, in I put it like this: Oracle has uh, products which are not open source, like, for example, um, uh, Mission Control and Flight Recorder. And these tools are diagnostic tools that tie into the, the virtual machine. So, whatever needs to happen there that's not in the open because it's not open source code. Um, and then of course we have commercial products around embedded systems. So Java C embedded uh, is one of those. And there are certain optimizations we have there which are not in the open. Or for example, ports of hotspot to ARM or to PowerPC from Oracle, which are commercial, you know, just in time compilers, yada, yada, yada. All these things are not in the open. So that's why it kind of depends. There is, um, how do I put this? The, most of the work you see um, and most of the features we bring in into, into the hotspot actually happen in OpenJDK, right? In particular, um, as, we, as we said in 2010, we're bringing you know, JROC and hotspot together by bringing the best features over from, from JROC into hotspot. And most of the performance work they release happening in OpenJDK. So for example, some of the patches that have showed up on the hotspot list recently from, from JROC teams were um, patches to remove the PermGAN support from hotspot which for those of you who don't know, hotspot coverage selectors basically have a separate space for um, long-lived metadata, right? And it's, um, how do I put this? 
um, you have to size it right, so to say. Otherwise, if, if, you're, if you get too much you know, classes to load and too much metadata, you get out of memory errors saying primgen, you know, space, exhausted, which isn't much fun because sometimes you just you know, don't know ahead of time how much class you're gonna load, for example, with dynamic systems. And JRocket uh, being a VM that uh, Oracle uh, got through BA, um, has been actually highly tuned to this enterprise server setups. And that was one of the features they didn't have, kind of like an anti-feature. And that's something that made its way straight into Hotspot, uh, or it's making its way straight into Hotspot from JRocket. And as Henrik said in his blog post on our JVM strategy back in 2010, uh, the contribution from Oracle in, into, into OpenJDK around Hotspot there is probably gonna be the, the largest one the project received in its history, right? Because there's so much good stuff that's being brought over that way. But there are also some, some other fun benefits. Um, one of the more interesting projects right now in, in JDK 8 is uh, the work to rework the build system. Um, so if you ever tried to build OpenJDK yourself, you know we use Make. Make is awesome. Um, we also use Ant and all these things, but Make is awesome. Um, the thing we, we don't use in OpenJDK so far was the, the typical Linux setup that configure and automate in these things. And one of the projects we had, um, or we have going on right now, is a build infrastructure project which basically uh, uh, is, is a rewrite of the, the make files we have across uh, OpenJDK 8 to use you know, configure and then to use uh, a whole bunch of tricks from GNU make to make the compilations much faster, as well as to use a kind of a server mode, Java C, and multi-core enabled Java C, uh, which reduces our build times you know, in JDK 8 from something like half an hour to about seven, eight minutes on Linux. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that's obviously you know, in open JDK and it gets adopted everywhere. Well, if you're all hungry, that's okay. I'd like to thank you for, for coming. It's been fun talking with you. And see you at the booth. <laughs>